Welcome to another Café Rollist. Uh, to be on Café Rollist, it's very simple. You got a project, you email me, you ask me, can I be on Café Rollist? And in most cases, not always, but most cases, I say, sure, come over. And today we have <laughs> Peter. Peter, could you introduce yourself to our viewers, please? I'd be very glad to. So my name is Pete Petrusha. I made a new game on Kickstarter called Rest in Pieces. I run conventions when we have those for the Indie Game Developer Network. And I write uh, GM advice for Gnome Stew, the GM blog. Uh, Gnome Stew, uh, well, what's the connection with Gnome Stew? I'm a big listener of Misdirected Mark podcast. I think you're in the same pot with Gnome Stew. I'm not entirely sure how, how it works. They're on the same network. So I think the, the Rollistus is on the RPG Academy network. So it's kind of like that. The Misdirected Mark had some, um, I know it came after Gnome Stew. And it was started by, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Phil Vecchione, I believe. Uh, Phil Vecchione and Chris, I think, Sneziak were the first two who did the misdirected mark. And those two were already gnomes, right, you know, writing for the, the, the GM blog. So it kind of branched out with uh, a core base. Like Senda is also a, a writer for Gnome Stew, and she has she's a super geek. So it's just kind of grown out of it. And now the misdirected mark is probably much bigger than the one Gnome Stew blog. So there's a whole family of podcasts. You were mentioning conventions, and I believe you've got uh, a reminder slash announcement to tell about uh, upcoming convention and the type of support you can give some people to g join some. Oh, sure. Yeah, so um, not really convention in this case. Normally, it would be convention related. But, uh, it's not um, related to this... Metatopia then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, the Indie Game Developer Network is just a uh, like a, a big group it works as a co-op of game designers and publishers and freelancers that just work together to have some collective strength, uh, you know, to have a booth at Gen Con, to uh, do cool things like we, we host the Indie Groundbreaker Awards show. But one of the coolest things, if not the best thing we do, is this thing we usually call the um, IGDN Metatopia Sponsorship. And it's a, pro a project to find marginalized game designers, you know, people of color, people, uh, you know, from other countries that don't have access to maybe um, the tools and the resources in the community they need to build a game and put it out there. Uh, we try to find people from all over, from all different backgrounds and give them a leg, this, you know, a foot in the door uh, by giving them money and shining a spotlight on them and helping them find mentors. And usually by sending them to Metatopia, which is a game design festival. And then, you know, everybody talks to them and they do panels and we support them. We play their games and all the publishers go to, you know, check them out. But this year, Metatopia is online. It's virtual. So uh, we're doing things different. The IGDN diversity sponsorship is what we're calling it. We've raised a whole bunch of money and we have some amazing publishers and game designers like uh, Shannon Jermaine from Money Cook Games. And I know Evil Hat's helping and all kinds of people um, are going to help putting on seminars for the the new cadre of uh, people who apply. So long segue, but you can still apply today until midnight Eastern Standard Time in the United States um, to be, be possibly picked as an applicant um, to have some of this money pushed towards you and your game, uh, a hand to help you up and help you in, a whole team of people who want to help uh, strengthen the voice, like add more diversity to the voice of game designers and game publishers in the tabletop RPG industry. So um, it's a really cool thing. You can go to IGDNonline.com and there's a little header that says uh, uh, IGDN diversity sponsorship. You can click over there. Amazing. Well, yeah, the more diverse, the better. I think even as someone who would not benefit from that because our uh, privilege uh, in a, a number of ways, I still find it's uh, it's uh, it's much better for the whole community to have point of views and ideas who come from a di diverse range of uh, individuals. Uh, but talking about games and ideas which are original, today we are here to talk about Rest in Peace, your your own game. So tell us about that. Where to start with that game? Sure. So one of the things I'm really excited to talk to you about is um, when I first. Uh, started sending out playtest copies of this game, we sent some to Ireland. And oh, I, wow. I was like, okay, check out my deadbeat roommate comedy. It's a dark comedy about, you know, difficult friendships and bad days. And they were like, I don't get it. <laughs> <'Cause they're> like, <laughs> what is a deadbeat 
what is Rick and Morty? What is the regular show? Um, wh why are these roommates bad to each other? <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. So in the United States, we have a lot of slacker comedies. You know, the, there are shows that like, it's always sunny in Philadelphia where a group of people are probably, you know, they're all kind of degenerates out for themselves. They're trying to figure out how to make a buck, right? And they usually do outlandish things that screw a lot of people over in the hopes of making a few extra dollars or getting famous or getting uh, the attention of, uh, you know, a potential love interest. Um, but it's funny. And we just find these shows funny. Like the regular show is another show where it's these two slacker characters who work at a park and everyone else knows they're the slackers. They can't be trusted with anything. And every episode they get some menial thing that happens that just blows up and gets more and more ridiculous by the end. So this is a game that's a dark comedy uh, about player characters who are roommates, who are kind of problematic roommates, flatmates, if you will. And the prime, <laughs> the prime problem is they live with the Grim Reaper, who's also a slacker version of the Grim Reaper, you know, who maybe drinks all the milk, won't get off the couch, won't share the TV, wants them to be quiet. Um, and then we add outlandish problems like the Grim Reaper is addicted to the home shopping network and just keeps buying crazy stuff, filling the pad up. Um, so it's kind of this pressure cooker where everyone like is forced to live on top of each other in a very small cramped space that they're stuck in and everyone's problems are, are just thrown at each other and everyone's just forced to kind of deal with it. But it's just a ridiculous lighthearted game. It's funny. It you plays in about an hour and it uses a two color Jenga tower. So that kind of helps pace it. So you were mentioning that you, you contacted people in Ireland and they, they were not aware of it. I'm a bit, I'm a bit surprised. I was trying to think of similar shows from Great Britain and uh, by extension uh, Ireland, which is not all part of Great Britain. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was thinking IT crowds, Spaced. It's one <laughs> I, I really recommend people abroad to check out. That's a classic for geeks yeah. and nerds here. <laughs> Uh, made by uh, that's what made Simon Peck famous and Ed Edgar Wright who went on to to be a, oh, a movie cool. director. Oh yes, yeah, spaced. You should check it out. I mean, you, this could be a spaced <laughs> episode. What you are de describing, and, yeah. Uh, and what you and were even stuff like The Office could be a, a good example. Yeah. You know, The Office is always these normal people, but then things just the the ridiculous ideas just keep getting crazier and crazier and then the show's over and you're like what the what was that what just happened you know? I really like so. coupling it's not quite slackers but they 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 certainly clueless to some expo uh, uh, point <laughs> coupling is more like the friends of the UK I would say uh, oh yeah Red Dwarf is in space but that's pretty much there and in Ireland one I recommend but I will tell people to use piracy because the the creator sadly I, I love the show but the creator is a terrible individual uh, turns out to to become one or to to have been revealed as one but uh, father ted in which you you have three slacker uh, priest in a small island uh, in ireland uh, were absolutely clueless but uh, i could definitely see an episode with a, a grim reaper in there that could be that could be quite cool <laughs> as a setup you're all priest you're Roomies, the slacking priest with the Grim Reaper, that could definitely work. Uh, yeah, and the big the big thing with the Grim Reaper is just that we're we're telling you that there's going to be some cartoon logic. We're telling you that it's going to get ridiculous and crazy. But the fun thing about the Grim Reaper is the Grim Reaper you just can't get rid of them, right? Because you can't go fight the Grim Reaper. You can't push them. You can't attack them. You can't maybe even kill them. So, and if you try they might just outright kill you, right? Because they're, they're impossibly powerful. They're kind of alien to the nature of what your problems are. Um, and when we, we tweak that to say that they're a pain in the butt, like they do ridiculous, stupid roommate problem things, um, it, it just amps up the situation. But sometimes in play, it's not about the Grim Reaper. Even though the Grim Reaper is my tool as a game master to insert a crazy problem that gets worse and worse and worse, like an overarching scenario, um, the players don't have to deal with it, right? We know it's gonna go, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, if it even gets better. So that can keep happening in the background. You could be slackers worrying about, you know, becoming famous as like some kind of street musicians or something, um, but that will blow up eventually and it'll take out you in the apartment or something. So, so it's just 
you can play the game you want to play, but it is installed in there to just kind of keep taking it to the next level and helping a game master do that, right? So that they don't have to improv everything. And, no, uh, I want to make a a hack uh, of it, which would be inspired by the shorts they made for the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, and uh, your your housemate would be Thor. I don't know if you see yeah, those shorts, or or the master <laughs> as played by Jeff Goblin, and they, they all had the same Rumi from Australia. So that could be uh, that could be interesting playing the game within the MCU. Yeah. Well, you, you, you pretty much touched right on the head is it's on Kickstarter now. So the core game is death is the roommate and death's uh, apartment is a basement studio apartment uh, that has coffin shaped cabinets and an extensive set of kitchenware, you know, because that's the stuff that death would have um, the expansions, which the game already starts with two, but we have many more we can unlock on the stretch goals is we have the great Cthulhu. And of course, the, it's the slacker version of Cthulhu. So Cthulhu is very sleepy, is oblivious, and is kind of a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> we have Karen, the ferryman to the underworld. And what I love in particular about Karen is, you know, what's Karen's kind of superpower? If you do anything that outright threatens Karen, we just montage to you being like <laughs> rowed over the river Styx to the underworld. It doesn't say how. You just get thrown in a boat and you're taken away. Um but like Karen unlocks the boathouse that's on the river sticks. So each time, each new character is not just a new character, but um, comes with new scenarios, like overarching problems that fit them and their new location. So they're just kind of, you don't need them, but right, if you want to add on and you want to change it up and you want to have a different play style, or if you don't think the Grim Reaper's funny and you want Karen or Cthulhu, but we do, we have a, a Deadpool character that's hiding up there somewhere in the oh. construction. So there, we've we've got gotcha. you. You know, we have some ideas. So, are they, are they in the expanded universe? You would say is uh, Cthulhu living well, across the road from yeah. the Grim Reaper? Or? That's what I like to think that I know. Um, so all the expansions are written. Um, they haven't all been put on the cards, but uh, you know, I've had the stretch goal writers write them ahead of time, so uh, that they're all ready to go if I need to. We'll see how many. I, I don't plan to make them all unless we unlock them. But you know. Um, and a couple of them have played with that because I know of they they talked you know amongst the different stretch goal writers. So uh, there's a couple. I know that one of them has a wedding, and the the oh. officiant is one of the other characters. So <laughs> I, I thought that was really clever. Yeah. So uh, you you briefly mentioned the the system. I don't resist to to put on some pictures uh, from from the game. Can you tell us a bit uh, uh, more uh, about that the the way it worked because. Uh, I mentioned to you before, and people listening regularly, I'm developing my own game, Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventory. Yes. And it, I find it fascinating because we, we've got some a sort of overlap. Uh, the, the references I always had was Baron Munchausen in terms of being a playful story game short format. Uh, yes. But I got some aspects which are almost board gamey, and you, you went full on into that uh, with yeah. uh, your... Uh, I mean, references, obvious references like Starcross or Dread come to mind, but you, you're even yeah. more gaming it. So, yeah, tell us about all of, everything which is on the table when we play sure. Rest in Pieces. Yeah, so my, my new favorite thing I got from a GM, on we, we ran this actual play with this group called Devil's Luck Gaming. And the GM, GM Fox, um, they said that they thought this was uh, Fiasco meets Dread. And I was like, that's pretty good because it's the zany, crazy, almost improv of fiasco. And we know it's going to go crazy wrong, but then it's got a little bit of the, obviously the supernatural, the horror of dread, and then the tension of the block tower. Though when the block tower falls, we just know that's what the ridiculous climax of our story, which may end the show, right? It's the end of the episode kind of thing. Uh, maybe it's to be continued or maybe it's over. Um, so the game plays everyone has a five by seven character card. So just think of like a, a big card, like a big index card, but it's dry erase. And there's a, a deck of 108 cards um, that are all unique, right? They're not playing cards. And um, on those cards, like about 10 of them are the rules. Uh, there's, so there's no book right now. There's just 10 cards of the rules. Um, and then there's uh, about 13 dead end jobs, 13 odd hobbies, 13 deadly objects. And those are like the three core cards that you're going to have that describe 
how your character doesn't suck, <laughs> right? Because we, we already assume you're a deadbeat slacker character. So we, we expect you to kind of not be good at anything. So to have any chance of being okay at something, it's going to be because of these unique, ridiculous <laughs> categories, right? You have a, maybe you're a sandwich artist. So I don't know how often that's going to be helpful, but that's kind of part of the joke. You're not really equipped to deal with, especially if things go crazy and there's supernatural problems. You're not really equipped to deal with that. So it's going to be fun for you to try and we'll see where the story goes, but you probably can't solve things. <clears throat> you might be a sign spinner. One of those people on the side of the road that's trying to get your attention, spinning a sign, like, come here, oh. we have a great deal. Um, the deadly objects reflect things that death think is, thinks are cool. So it could be a megaphone, a skateboard, or a human skull. <laughs> um, the odd hobbies. So death maybe thinks that playing with fire is cool. Forensics, um, or also something like a, what was a twisted artwork. So you you just draw a few cards. Some of them you draw, some of them you select, like you can scroll through, like you're making your character. I want you to feel like you made a character. So when it comes to those, you, you pick cards, looking at them all. And you place them around your character card, kind of like making a character sheet without all the writing. You also get two pet peeve cards, which are uh, things that frustrate you about the other roommates. So we kind of bake that into the game. Uh, whether it's something like you're, you're annoyed that one of them always lies or one of them is always a jinx. And the fun part is they don't get to tell you that about them. You actually just draw the cards and assign them to the person on your left and the person on your right. And the idea is that everyone in that circle has some reason to be kind of passive aggressive towards the others, um, or at least have one person that's kind of, you know, a pain in the butt for them. Um, and then uh, we, we build this block tower. It's got two colors in the middle. I'm sorry, two different colors. There's uh, light blocks and dark blocks, not white and black. They're light and dark. Um, and when you go to do things in the game, um, you're going to try to pull a block from the tower to succeed. But the big difference in Rest in Pieces compared to Dread is you only get to touch so many blocks to do it. Because in Dread, or any time we play Jenga, if you're familiar with that game, um, players have a tendency to touch all of the blocks and find the good one. This is a game where we expect more failure. It's about bad days. It's about people doing things and not getting it all right. So when you go to touch a block from the tower to see if it works, you only get to touch one block unless you can use one of your dead end jobs, odd hobbies or deadly objects to help you. And oh, there's also all the nice. fun mechanics. You can, you can borrow other people's. If you're paying attention to the person you're right and you're like, oh, an extension later, I need that. And when you use a card, you flip it. So what's funny is if you borrow someone else's thing and explain why it helped you, the story game aspect of it, right? You flip their card instead of flipping one of yours and then you can unflip one of yours. And the whole flipping thing is just meant so that you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. So I was inspired to, to do a game uh, having a lot of people on the show and telling me uh, about their games. And so I listened very closely when they were giving advice regarding Kickstarter, especially people based here in the UK. And uh, we yeah. had a, a whole panel called Recipes uh, for Successful <laughs> Kickstarter, British Recipes. Really? That's hilarious. For yeah. British Recipes for Successful Kickstarters. And one of the, the strong advice I got was... Be careful with your role-playing game because, because of shipping, because of the way of taxation. Yes. As soon as you do more than a book, uh, it yeah. becomes a luxury item, unlike a book. So you're going to pay more taxes and then your, your stuff is yeah. going to be heavy and so on. And you went full on. You went with the Jenga tower, yes. with the cards, with the, the boards uh, and, and all of that. So... Uh, how much did you feel it was necessary that you go this way? Unlike Dread, which is just a book and you find a Jenga tower, or Starcross, just yeah. a book and you find... What were the pros and cons for, for you to <clears throat> do that? And are you shipping internationally, actually, all, all that stuff? Yeah, Yeah. so, okay. Um, my first game on Kickstarter was Dream Chaser, a game of destiny. Um, it's a very... It, I like to say it's an empowering game. Uh, it empowers players to story build and to... Uh, create unique characters and unique goals for them, uh, for their game. Uh, it starts by asking each player, what do you want to achieve? And then it helps kind of craft that story around one unique thing that they voted in, right? So and they make their game to play. Um, 
the deluxe sets of those had a box, had a board, a storyboard that we had that we put index cards to kind of mold, shape what our story was going to look like. Um, it had uh, a GM screen. So I have, I have some experience um, sourcing different materials. Um, we, we're, we're just very lucky. Um, there's a lot of competition when it comes to overseas manufacturers. Print and demand keeps getting better and better. Um, so even if you have these smaller numbers, like in that case with the deluxe boxes, I was never going to be able to do like mass production for those. Um, but I was able to kind of work with making proofs and sending digital files and getting prototypes and checking out different quality levels. And it was my first game. So I, I checked out all kinds of companies um, that did print on demand or did, you know, small quantities to really shop around, get an idea of everyone's different quality levels. So the long story of that is just that uh, I had quite a bit of experience um, for a person who's in the indie scene who's working on a second product. Um, and I've seen a lot of things uh, as the convention coordinator uh, going convention to convention, helping to sell, you know, our hundred plus member stuff and setting up the booths and decorating, talking to consumers and trying to get an idea of what what's tr what's pulling them in the booth. What do they look at? What do they play with? How do they interact? What questions they ask? So um, the big part was that, you know, Starcrossed won the Diana Jones Award last year. Everybody that's heard of Dread loves Dread. And it's a very casual audience person's game. Like uh, the casual audience, whether it's on Geek and Sundry or, you know, uh, a lot of people will be like, oh, I saw the Jenga Tower game on, you know, uh, tabletop. So I knew that there was a lot of attention with with the tower. Starcrossed wasn't even an idea when I when I started this because I took longer, I think, than Starcrossed. Um, but I saw the functionality of it. And in 2017, I went to PAX Unplugged, and I realized at that time the audience was looking for games in boxes, not games in books. And they didn't have this storied history of our role playing games. So one person had even seen um, a vampire related game and said, "Oh, is this like?" D, D with vampires and it really just kind of like twisted my my perspective and i realized they wanted games they could buy now and go play in the hallway they didn't want games where they could take them home read them in six months and then you know maybe run them for people yeah so it, it made me think that if i could do it what i wanted to do was make a game that you could kind of pick up and play uh but like right now and there was nothing like even card games that take longer, there's a perception. Yeah. People think that if it's a card game, we can go play right now. It's also interesting so, to to picture someone picks up a, a copy of Rest in Pieces uh, at PAX, for instance, uh, in a world where the yeah. pandemic is under control. But uh, yes. <laughs> they, they they go in the into the lobby and they start playing it, and the Jenga tower with its color and uh, the gaming ads. It's it's advertising on itself. It's I mean it's like sure. s something like Sagrada. Before I played Sagrada, I saw people playing Sagrada, and I was yeah. like, "Wow, that's that's beautiful! This game. W what is it? Oh, it's Sagrada. You could you should go check it check it out." Yeah, it's, it's and, and then they walk thing. back in the hall and they go, "Oh my god, can I get one of those?" Because I saw people on, and it's a funny game. So. If you see a group of people and they're just laughing and then the tower falls and it's hilarious and they're pointing the finger at each other, I was like, what a great way to get more people playing a role-playing game. So, um, and some of that came from the whole Dream Chaser thing. Dream Chaser was meant to be very approachable. It's meant so you could start quick. So I was already on that train of thought. And um, as a game designer, when you make, before you make a game, right, you have these lists, you know, I want to make this and I want to make this and I have this idea and this system idea. And it's a matter of eventually like this system matches this concept and then you go, oh, cool. And that list keeps changing. It keeps moving like this game gets bumped up and this game gets bumped down. So I'd always wanted to innovate on Dread. And that was just largely a game design challenge. I thought that I was kind of surprised that in you know 10 plus years that nobody had really done more with Dread. Um, and some of that was um, perspective, um, not totally fully appreciating the complete beauty of its simplicity. Um, some of that was um, not knowing all the hacks that are out there. There's a ton of great hacks with all kinds of great house rules. Um, yeah, so it was it was a neat journey, right? Because sometimes you're also making things to see where it takes you and where a game comes from. And, and ultimately, if it doesn't get to where you want it to be, you move on to the next one. 
So that that's kind of the whole picture, right? Is I was looking for a product to fit this whole packs unplugged model that I thought would sell and would be appealing and would get more people into the RPG hobby. I was thinking in my head about dread. Um, I I was thinking about uh, how I could make a game that was more approachable. So yeah, and this has that fee that a uh, dread not dread thing. Um, gosh, I can't think of the game, but. You know, every I, I thought everyone could kind of relate to a problematic roommate situation. Yeah. So it has that element of it's not a far stretch for the average person on the street who might be interested in role playing. You can be like, yeah, just remember when your your brother sucked or your sister and they were a pain in the butt, or you know, remember when you went to college and those people. Be that person and um, realize that like this is what's going on, and they go, oh, okay. And I think that gap is important sometimes of getting new people to the table, like spouses or partners or, you know, people who are interested, but they're not really into swords and sorcery or something. Yeah, it's, it seems nicely self-contained and it's fitting for a one shot, but it could be nice as a episodic game uh, since you've got the, the TV show uh, sort uh, of format. But what, what's something you mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, I, I played Dread only once, uh, I game mastered it. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea you said, okay, you, you cannot touch the Jenga tower, or you can, but when you do, you need to bring some narrative material. You need to make a statement yeah. which is, oh, yeah, but uh, I'm a champion, in, I'm a perfectionist in terms of doing uh, sandwiches, <laughs> yeah. and we are in a subway, so uh, we, we're doing this thing. Uh, by the way, for the people in the news, it uh, turns out that the Supreme Court, they got a Supreme Court in Ireland as well, and it's as useful as it is in, in the US, because they just... Oh, the bread. They just uh, cl clarified the fact that there was too much sugar in uh, Subway bread for it to qualify as bread. So just... Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I read that too. I was like, what? But yeah, I like this idea that... Because when we played Dread... As soon there was this tension, but as soon as the interaction with the Jenga yeah. Tower started, everything sort of went to a, a standstill. It was a it was a stop to yeah. the narration. So the idea that you, as you do it, you're coming up with ideas or other stuff uh, is very yeah. interesting. Yeah, because so that's a little bit of an uphill battle. Is um, just to take a moment of talking about it, because also like you said, you're working on a game, thinking about a game with components. And it's, I didn't even talk about you know, the things you were mentioning, like the costs and the shipping. We can get back to that if you want to. But the hard part is the mentality. Um, I think now is a very beautiful time where more people are interested in the blending of board games and role-playing games and cards and role-playing games are becoming more and more prevalent. It's not a crazy idea as much as it used to be. Um, alternatives to dice are more accepted. And there's still a lot, a long way to go, but we're in a place where that's happening, and it's kind of the forefront. You know, Fiasco went to cards. Um, we're, we're just Zombie World got three or four Emmy nods, you know, and it's a card based, powered by the apocalypse. So we're, we're there, um, and so I thought this is as good a time as any for this to be component kind of rich. Um, but it's very difficult, especially when you're mostly selling on the internet. You're mostly reaching out to groups. Um, and there's still plenty of people who my role-playing game should have dice because pulling blocks from a tower is going to stop all of the, you know, the tension or the narrative. But I mean, is it, I mean, you, you kind of have to ask yourself, or are we just completely used to dice in our role-playing games? Like some games, you're right. I already have the dice in my hand. I roll and I never stop talking. Some games I got to stop and I got to find my dice pool and I got to put it together and then I got to roll. And then I got to count the pips or the number of successes or the very degree of success. Or, you know, if it's feng shui, we got to find out like what my target number was and how much I, I you know, my modifier was by and how that affected each person. These things take time. So it does really depend on your play style, who you play with. Um, so when you said that, like, I've had plenty of people who are like, oh, I don't know, a black tower is, you know, everything stops when you have to pull from the tower. It doesn't have to, right? That's just how it worked for Dread. So that was one of those things that I had in mind, you know, of course. And you don't always get the time for this kind of discourse, right? To be like, no, I hear you. I, I, that's one of the reasons why we, you know, we try to push beyond that. I can't tell your players how to play. I can try. I can give you rules, right? Guidelines and stuff. 
But uh, if you follow the guidelines, they, they can help you deal with that, right? Like we're going to talk about what we're doing as we touch one block or two, right? And if, if I want to touch another one, I got to pick a card to play, which then I have to explain how it helps. And if I borrow yours, then we're laughing about how I stole your thing to do the thing as I'm going to pull. And then if I pull it, I keep it. And then everyone's like, oh, cool. And oh, wow, he's got four blocks now. So, well, you know, we have more, he's got more influence in the apartment now than the rest of us. And now he could play this other card he's got in his hand. So it's hard to break through uh, the mindsets, you know, of is this a board game? Is it a role playing game? Can it be both, you know? Do blocks necessarily stop narrative? They don't have to, you know. So it's it's very interesting, but it's difficult. Uh, you will you will always be fighting an uphill battle with that because you know there's a storied history in both, and it's niche, right? This is all a niche industry. So it's nice because you you're challenging the the miscon the, the pre presumptions regarding a hobby, uh, yeah. the, and when you do that, it's not just about that specific instance of pushing the brief, but it's about I I always say if you have one thing of something like uh, I get on and on and on again about the players, we, it's it's their thing, it's fine. But uh, I still lament that some players play strictly one role playing game, which is Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. And I, and it's my personal belief that when you play something, there's one version of. Uh, it's difficult to imagine a second one, but once you play the second one, you imagine a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. So once you play the role playing game yeah. with a Jenga tower, suddenly you're like, "Well, I could play with a a board of Go, or I could play with uh, <laughs> uh, what's what's called the game of life with the uh, the thing which spins in the middle. Yeah. Anything could could happen. Suddenly you you open the world. Uh, and where was I going <laughs> with that? So, hey, so have you talked to Craig Campbell? Craig Campbell made the capers. And, you know, capers, like you play blackjack. Every player's oh. got their own card deck and they're kind of playing blackjack against the GM. And I like, that's really, that's amazing. And that game is about the roaring 20s, you know, the, the early 1920s in the US where there's prohibition, no alcohol, and everyone's kind of underground, everyone's smoking. So playing blackjack, playing cards in that era when everyone would be at cards, smoking, you know, almost like in a gambling situation, that was really smart because you it helps the theme too. I, re you know, I think that was the, much better than rolling dice. I think the original Deadlands also was like that. You played with cards, and again, the the poker and the the cowboys, the, yeah. the old west setting. Yeah, that's that, a good example. Yeah, that's something. When I I found out about that when I was a young player, I was all <laughs> yeah, uh, pun intended. I was all in. <laughs> I was very interested yeah. in this because <laughs> you you're really in the mood uh, and so on. Uh, but in what you were saying, what I find interesting because that's a question I raised at the latest game launch uh, organized by Jason Pitt reg regarding my game. I was asking, what should I name my game? Because is it a board game? Is it a story game? Oh, is it a yeah. role-playing game? And it's interesting in terms of audience because or the conclusion of the discussion was stick to role-playing game because you need a strong, robust foundation of people who are motivated to, to cool. push the, the early yeah. stages. And that's what the role-playing community is. But yeah. in what you describe of the, the pushback and the, the presumptions and at the same time the other audience, what I find fascinating and I find Rest in Pieces definitely crosses that line is that because of the, the format of the game, the gaming ads, you definitely can attract people who have no interest whatsoever in role-playing game because they, they won't even realize they're buying a role-playing game. They will feel like maybe yeah. they played Werewolf, <laughs> Uh, yeah. which is a French game actually uh, they, they will they will feel like they're playing a story game like cash I think cash games also you had foam guns and stuff like that uh, they will buy your game not being aware it's a role playing game so did, did, you, did you did you sort of have an angle towards I, I guess there's a very well as far as I know there's a very thriving uh, board game community on Kickstarter as well as tabletop role playing yeah. game. Did you did you approach that community specifically in a different manner than you did the role playing community? Um, I, you know, I did unintentionally. Um, I had this really great video that was made by a uh, Glory Hound. Uh, Glory Hound is cat writer from the Dice Tower. She has a uh, uh, her own little company that does Kickstarter previews and reviews and stuff. Oh wow. So uh, when I reached out to them, 
uh, for advertising, they did a you know a video review and they take amazing photos and they open all the components and put it out there. And, you know, so I, I was like, I need some of that if I'm going to even catch the eye of some of the board game audience. Because there's definitely a level of critique that's different in Kickstarter for board games versus role-playing games. Um, role-playing games don't tell you how the game's going to end. They tell you how you know what's going to help mold the story, but it's up to the players, right? There's no win condition. So you can see it in our Kickstarter pages. You know, we don't need all the specifics. We need to, we need we need to know what we're looking at, but we we don't need all of the specifics. But um, you know, board gamers are looking for like the board game geek you know ratings they wanted to see the reviews and the critiques they want to know if the game's you know too overpowered or unbalanced you know specifics so uh anyway I, unintentionally uh she called it a narrative board game which again is funny right because there's no board right so it's more of a narrative card game if you wanted to say that but then it's got the tower so i, I do feel like some of the branding uh almost was out of my control because uh, the video was so good i was like Okay, I, I wish she would have said role playing game because somebody Kickstarter is also a crowd of fanatics, right? Like a fanboys and girls and you know people who know their stuff. So um, there are gonna be some people who watch that video and go, "Oh, it's a board game. I'm out." You know, I'm like, "No, no, no, no! You missed it. It's actually a role playing game. You would play it and be like, this is a role playing game,' because uh, I don't tell you how to win. But uh, you know, that it's just it is like I said. That's the difficult part. Is some things will be red flags for either side and you can't win them all right some people are going to be like oh it's a board game oh it's a role-playing game um so i've tried to uh, reach out to the board game side of things uh you know they try to put it out there uh, i can't say that i've been very successful i thought this product would be more successful on that on that um leaning right uh and maybe it will with the appeal especially when it, it you know if we fund and i get enough money to mass produce it right uh because I, I know I can sell the crap out of it when I'm like in person and it's on a table when I go here, like you want to play a minute, like I can show <laughs> it to you. Right. But it's just a different story right now. And the news cycles, and it's so hard right now with the news to really get, um, got, you know, <laughs> warning to people who are putting Kickstarters out right now. Um, one of the things I didn't think of, I knew the election in the U S is going on. Right. And, but it's Halloween. Halloween's good for Kickstarters and, this is a fun twist, right? It's not all gore and like dark horror, right? It's like, let's laugh about it, right? Uh, which we could use some laughter right now. But I didn't also think of how many people are checked out on social media right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, I look at my, my social media list and I'm like, oh, so-and-so has been gone since March, <laughs> right? Like, like people just logged off, signed out, you know, gave up on social media in some cases. So there's a lot of people uh, that I've noticed that are, you know, in our RPG friends that uh, a lot, of, some people aren't twice as much, but a lot of people have also checked out. So that's, that, that's been an added difficulty this year because with the elections and all the infighting and then COVID, a lot of people are just like, ah, I'll come back to social media in 2021. It's yeah, also, like it's, all it's also, I imagine, I mean, we are, I don't quite follow the, the board game community. I'm a, I'm a very light touch board gamer. I've been playing some Carcassonne lately and I had not played any board game since the, the beginning of the first lockdown here in the UK. And here I yeah. could play because I, was, I had my mom staying over. But oh, I, cool. I, I, I imagine that uh, the board game community is facing its own very specific sets of challenges compared to the role-playing game community. Uh, I've seen, uh, and we're going to have a lot of guests uh, in the future, it's planned. Uh, speaking about more online conventions happening for role players, we got Akadecon, which is going to happen online. So we're going yes. people to check that out. Uh, and yeah, so in a way, I never played as many role playing games, and I know a lot of people who are in the same situation. If I was hardcore board gamer, well, I'm facing a, a much harder challenge because why? I we have a lot of people arguing. Oh, I don't like playing online a role playing game because it's not the same as being face to face and so on. I would argue it's 80% the same to some extent. Uh, I would go as far. But if sure. we're talking about a board game with pawns and a board and a Jenga tower, uh, I know Michael from the RPG Academy has got a uh, Scooby-Doo Dread system. He, he can oh, run on go, yeah. He found a way to do the Jenga tower uh, online somehow. I think everybody needs a Jenga tower at home. But anyway, uh, yeah. it's... Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of so of people in the board game community who got cold feet because some Kickstarter they might have pledged to right now are facing difficulties in terms of deliveries. Oh, yeah. 
So uh, sure. yeah, I imagine all of that is impacting the the board game community. I, I you know, and it's you can you only get so much to say to people, right? Because you you just people are busy too. People are so busy right now. Um, I, you want to tell them everything. You want to be like, this game is cool because of A, B, C, D, and E. But you know, even my last game, like I, I had a Kickstarter and I delivered to everyone on time. You know, so that I, I do have a track record. Like you will get this by June in June. How, because because I'm trying to get it to you in April or May. That's that's the real why, right? But you have to have that mentality, um, and you also have to accept as a game designer that like perfection is the enemy of done. You yeah. Know, Fred Hicks told me that, and I think that's so valuable. Is that of course I can keep tweaking and trying to make that last five percent of a game is the hardest, right? Like that when it's ninety percent done, you know, you take it to Kickstarter, but. Kickstarter should have a voice in what your game looks like and what it becomes, because that's the reason it's there, right? It becomes our game. So I bring you in. So you help me set up a pre-order and tell me that this game is viable, right? Because if, if nobody backs, then I go, Oh, Whoa, thank you. In a way, thank you. Because you told me don't make this game. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's better than yeah. go out there and then just not have a business case yes. have a, a failed business rather than have a failed Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> the, sometimes I do think it's very valuable, right? Like, especially if you know that the quality will improve, like I know like that with the yellow King recently with Pelgrane, you know, there, there are times when they go, Hey, it's going to be late, but this is why I, I get that. But I do think that all too often too, we're like, we have this mentality problem of you got to do what you say you're going to do. Right. So some things are out of your control, but a lot of things aren't. So, I mean, obviously, if my shipment blows up into the ocean or something, that's out of my control, right? But but if I, if it's because I was like, well, you know, I could make it 1% better here or 1% better here, I promised you something. I got to make that happen. So, Yeah. You mentioned conventions. Uh, my own game... Uh, the lockdown's been sort of a an opportunity for it more than anything because it gave me the opportunity to run it online at conventions I couldn't. It looks like you've been doing very well with that too. I saw <laughs> I saw all the different conventions. Yeah, that's good job. You know, the hustle is so important. You got to get it out there, and uh, every one of those people, um, you know, is a person who will help spread the word. Will back it. You know, the hopefully you can try to keep that community. Well, you have the podcast. Yeah, that's just. Uh, I know, like in my case, you try to build that email list, right, so that you can talk to them later. You don't lose them. It's not but everyone's on Facebook or Twitter. Or, you did know, you so. did you manage a way? Is there a way to to run your own hustle uh, online besides being a guest on uh, on shows like mine? Uh, uh, are there ways to play your game uh, online? Did did you venture in sure. trying to do that? The hardest thing, <laughs> the hardest thing is the tower. Um, there is on Tabletop Simulator a hack of you know, not dread a hack of jenga called flick um the problem with flick is that one it's called flick because you don't pull blocks from the tower it doesn't have that physics it has it's like imagine pulling a rubber band back and then letting it go and then if it hits the block right it shoots it out the other side so that's a completely different kind of play um but worse is that it's much more skill <laughs> people think that uh they're not wrong. There is skill to Jenga, but they there's a perception that it's a lot harder than it is because that was the biggest design challenge I had was learning over time through playtesting how good people are at Jenga that have never played before or that think they're bad because everyone's really, really good at it compared to what they think. Um, so unfortunately, Flick is not a good solution. Um, and even if it was, I have two colors to my tower, not one. So the best solution we have is actually having like piles of cards you know, here's 20 red cards, here's 20 black cards. And like every time you pull based on if I think your action is selfish or selfless, that's the dark light block difference. Um, we would flip a card and you'd see if you failed or if you pulled uh, or if the tower fell, like the results would be on a card. Um, that's the closest thing we have. Unfortunately, I don't really find that being very fun, right? It loses the whole tactile element. You don't have the rolling dice. It's just like we might as well play rock paper scissors, right? <laughs> because you're just kind of like, oh, oh, I did it, you know. Like it, is, it loses kind of the major element. So that's been the trouble. Um, I do have the cards that you use to explain the rules or to make your characters, and the character cards all on Tabletop Simulator. So what we have been doing is either 
I send them a tower or I use a tower that I have and I'm the designated puller. So that's been the, the challenge that we've had is that we have um, with the actual players, usually so far they've had, I've sent them prototypes, right? And then they used it all at their, their where they are. And then one of them had a GM run it there. So I was not involved. And the other one, I ran it online for them, but they had all the stuff in front of them. And they just made sure I could see the table so that I could kind of play off of the tension that's rising from the tower poles. And I could kind of see what cards they had. There's this one card deck called the middle finger card. Um, so when you pull a black from the tower, you can pull a middle finger card and it gives you one card in your hand. This one card does something uh, that usually it gives you a quote to say, like it says, wait, I, I what did you just do? I, I didn't see it. And it's a way of being like, you know, as a slacker roommate, they just did something cool, but you weren't paying attention because you're on your phone or whatever. So you, by saying that you put it in the game and they have to pull from the tower again, but they do it because you played the card. And then you get more blocks and having more blocks gives you more influence and more influence as you plays more of these cards and also talk, have more creative control over the story. So you want to have more pull in the apartment situation among the roommates so that you can say what happens when it ends and what happens when someone knocks the tower over. Uh, but also so you can play better cards on each other to make sure you, you're not the one who gets screwed over. So that's kind of the, the whole bag of playing it is so the, the GM does need to be able to see those cards because when you use them, death then takes the discard pile. So so death can get these superpower cards to screw you over too. So Actually, the Jenga Tower brings uh, something. I, I, I love the Jenga Tower. I think it, it's great. But when I run Dread, uh, someone commented, and I think it's, it's a valid uh, thing that they uh, didn't want it to play Dread because uh, they were really uncomfortable with the, the Jenga Tower uh, because yes. of skills reasons. But there yeah. are also uh, uh, a lot of people who cannot play with a Jenga Tower because they've got um, a disability of some kind. Yes. Uh, so I think it's great if you have uh, in place some alternate rules to yeah to for to be there for for this top yeah. type of situations and and people who who wish to play uh, uh, as well huh? yeah it's it's hard right because it's the very beauty difficult of the tower the beauty of the tower is that it adds that tactile element to it you know um i, I wrote an article for norm stew just kind of talking obviously i've been researching black tower games so you know one of the things i talked about is i think gm's could benefit from having more descriptions that are based on the five senses. Okay, so self-explanatory. We're always telling them what they see. We're telling them what they hear sometimes, but we don't always tell them what they smell or you know what something feels like to their touch or you know trying to talk to all of the senses because even with translation barriers or tr descriptions of words, we can lose some of that information, right? Because when I say something to you it doesn't necessarily process 100%. Like I, I get it, but I see, you said the sky is blue, but I see a different shade than you. And that might mean something later on. Like you see it's baby blue and I see it as, you know, dark water blue or something. So I like that there's a tactile nature to the game because we're interacting and engaging players on different levels of fun, right? Um, unfortunately, that also is gonna, not everyone has the same kinds of fun. So some people will really gravitate to a game where they get to touch more things, where they get more pieces to play with. Uh, and that'll keep them more engaged also as they're watching the block tower and watching other people pull and touch the blocks, see which ones are the good ones and the bad ones, um, seeing what other blocks people at the table. So it is a conscious choice, but it is a, an opportunity cost, right? Because people who are in have, you know, Parkinson's, people who have tremors, people who uh, have any sort of, you know, visual acuity issues, like, Right, it's unfortunate there's a trade-off, but that's just what they're always they're always going to be trade-offs, you know. Um, some people need braille dice, right, because they or they need someone to tell them what the dice says. Uh, it's not the same thing, but it's just always going to be an element. Uh, not every game, whether it's Wingspan or you know one of the games where you you flick your 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 uh, you flick your little fighter jets on the board to see where they go, is going to be uh, for everyone. But also, not every game is for everyone, right? That's the joke, right? This game is for people who like slacker comedies, 
right? This is for people, the RPG audience that like slacker comedies. That's my crossover here. I think also that um, there's a difference between having a game that anyone could play and a game which answers anyone, everyone's need at once. Uh, because if, if I play uh, uh, Rest in Pieces with a, mm -hmm. like my grandmother, an elderly who's got arthritis or something like that, I can find a solution for the Jenga Tower, but I don't need a solution for someone who would would be colorblind at the same time. So yeah. you you can accommodate uh, people needs uh, based on the situation. You, you but you cannot design yeah. a game which accommodates everybody's needs and tastes at once yeah. because it just becomes a. A, a sort of of nothing. Uh, I mean, I guess it's a, you know if you go into entertainment, if you have a movie or a song which tries to satisfy everyone, it becomes a, the blandest song you can imagine <laughs> or, or movie. Why, if you try to cater different tastes and needs, what well, yeah. you can be specifics and maybe answer right. the needs. Everybody's happy, but maybe not at, at the same thing <laughs> with the same time. Yeah, that, that's right. That's the uh, the old saying is right. Like if you make a game for everyone, you made a game for no one. Because it wasn't anybody's favorite game. It was everyone's, you know, it was a game everyone had. But, uh, you know, uh, and this game is very targeted, right? This game says, do you like dark comedies, right? Do you like the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy? Do you like the regular show? Do you like Rick and Morty? Do you like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Because we're going to play player characters that are fun to laugh at, right? They're going to do things that annoy and aggravate and frustrate the other characters. So, you're, you're playing a game knowing that this is lighthearted. It's going to be silly. You're not going to be able, you're not going to succeed all the time. And ultimately you're not going to succeed probably. Right. Um, but it's going to be funny to watch the train wreck and be a part of it. And hopefully we're all going to laugh and have a good time. All of those shows target mature audiences. This game has adult themes. This game is not something you're going to play with, you know, probably you're with a 12 year old for sure. Maybe with the 15, 16, 17, you know, your older teenager, right? But my argument was that I don't know how well they understand the roommate situation. If you're a minor, you had somebody who always picked up after you, paid the bills, was the responsible one. You haven't had to be that person yet, probably, right? So this game is really aged for the that sort of college age and above who have these experiences to pull off. Um, that know what it's like to be the good roommate and the bad roommate, right? And then when they're playing, sometimes by the choice of the light or the dark block that the GM tells them um, by their intentions, they're going to know what that choice looks like. Did I do this because I actually cared about the other roommates? Or did I do this because, nah, I really just wanted this to happen and that's more important to me right now. And the block tower is also fun because it makes each of those choices finite. Right. There's only 21 choices of each. There's only 21 good and 21 bad. And then the layout of the, the block tower limits that even further. Right. You might play a game where it's like there's only six blocks that can pull. I'm just drawing a number out of the air. Right. Only six good intention blocks that you can pull. Right. Then the game almost forces you to keep pulling bad ones or to keep failing. So when you you can you see it. So the game, it's important to say you pull a block to succeed. You keep it. If you give up, you fail, but you can give up pulling a block. Oh, this one's not coming out, I, I'm, I'm done. But you then need to have blocks to pay the Grim Reaper or the Grim Reaper kills your character. So, so if you give up on pulling a block, you have that hard choice of, oh, I have blocks I can spend, cool, here's a block death. Otherwise death finds the most mundane, nearby, immediate object to kill you with. And then you and the GM can like describe as much or as little as you want about how that happens. But you know, death is really good at killing people. So the the fun part is uh, in a previous game we played recently, um, or yeah, that I ran. Um, there was a a bounce castle, like those kids, like the bouncy castle sort of thing. And death grabbed like a wall piece and choked a player character with it, like it was like a balloon, like making a balloon uh, animal. <laughs> so we we just heard the squeaky noises. You know, it's like ergy ergy er er. er. As we described it, so it's funny you you mentioned that uh, it's college plus uh, type of age, but uh, the the art style is sort of I'm not sure it's the the official right name, but it's kind of self cal, kind of 
art. Uh, your, you mentioned Billy and yes. Mandy, which is for children. Uh, it reminds me also a, a lot of shows. Uh, there are Fangbone on Netflix. There's uh, Star <laughs> versus the Forces yeah. of Evil on Disney. On Disney. Uh, would a, a more younger audience version of uh, Rest in Pieces be something you, you'd consider at some point? Like, you got your Carcassonne kids and your Settlers of Catalan kids, so is that uh, something which you, you, you'd you be interested in doing uh, when you meet the success? Uh, it's funny or... you say that. Yeah, so I mean, it, it goes back to that whole conversation we're having, right? Making the game for a person in mind, like the audience in mind. So... You know, when this game cusses, it always does the, you know, F, you know, uh, hashtag, like it uses some symbols. I think they call it like Grawlix or something. Um, so it always gives you the feel of like, hey, we use vulgar language, but we always try to laughably middle school, like kind of uh, censor it a bit. Um, the game needed to have teeth, right? It needed to have attitude. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite quotes that I got from someone, which was you know it's a little storytelling a little jenga and a lot of attitude um and i think that's what it needed to be for the target audience yeah if this game was you know huge and we had another printing and we could you know make more i I'd, I'd be happy to make a a younger version i i just have to know that the core game has that appeal right and like i said because my core target audience was that college and above so that's kind of where the humor is gonna go the attitude is gonna go um you don't really want to joke with kids about drugs, <laughs> you know, so, stuff like that, right? You, you so it, the, it's the funny you said that doesn't... because uh, I'm running my game tonight, and for tonight I'm playing with the gauntlet, and they they're very focused, uh, rightfully, on safety tools and devices, and I, yes. I was borrowing a line and veil spreadsheet on which you you take an untick from a, another game from a, someone yeah. there, and and the list of stuff in there was really really hardcore because it was for a game which yes. could go very very far in terms of uh, horror, the sort of things, torture, suicide, this this sort of thing. So I try to make a line and veils document based on the the ratings for cartoons and video games and you know it, it's funny because <laughs> you read those things and then you realize yeah actually when I was a teenager I would go check I, like with my brother he's six years younger <laughs> than me I think he might have been 11 when we watched Robocop yeah Robocop is not made for kids. Oh it's my very god. Horror. So rest I in have peace. horror stories <laughs> like that scared that for for like I think I still have nightmares occasionally because it was so traumatic. I would watch that when I was a little kid. I was like, you know, five, six, seven at home alone. I was like, RoboCop, RoboCop. And like when they kill RoboCop, like, you know, he gets like shot oh, by all the people in like the, the junkyard. That was horrifying for me for so long. It's traumatized. But, you know, there's an appeal to that. The, almost yeah. when, you, when you're, you're a teenager or even a preteen to some extent, you know, playing with something, and I can see it could work with Rest in Pieces, which seems yeah, of un course. Un unassuming to parents, or, or your parents are being un understanding. <laughs> you, you, you Especially with the want, art style, you, know, like you, you can see it right there, you, you the read, banner in the corner. You read mad, you read stuff which are inappropriate yeah. for your age, and you enjoy it the more, even if you don't get all the intricacies, you go yes. there and you, you play Vampire the Masquerade because you're, ah, and my parents, <laughs> what are you playing? Nothing, mom. Everything is fine. Yeah. All right. No, you're right. You're right. I, obviously, I, I did know that, you know, I'm like, okay, by saying this is not for kids, maybe more attractive to teenagers. It It's just such a niche audience. It'd be one thing if, you know, we were talking about a game that sold was selling millions of copies, right? But that's not what most games in the board game, let alone role-playing game industry are doing. So you usually don't have a big enough appeal to really make those arguments. But uh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, especially with the art style, right? There's plenty of people who are going to buy the game and they're going to be like, oh, nothing, mom. We're just playing our little comedy <laughs> game. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they could pick it on the, the shelf and just hand it to their 11 yeah. years old. Yeah, go ahead, play with that. And like, ooh, drugs. And while it has <laughs> themes... Marijuana! Like <laughs> Right. I mean, the the game has themes like they're they're nothing, you know, wallet. You might have a card that said like a deadly object and maybe it's like recreational drugs. Right. It doesn't say it doesn't give you more a ton more to go with. Right. You're going to 
put that in your game and think of how recreational drugs are useful for your character. Like it, it just, but it has that, right? You know, um, does it have, maybe it mentions a prostitute or something, you know, but like, or a player character could choose to be a prostitute in the sleazy uh, motel version of the game, you know, but th that's, that's up to your group and your players, right? Like they can, you can play D and D and the player could be like, I'm going to make a prostitute, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to make a drug dealer in cyberpunk. So the game never goes off the deep end. Uh, it, I mean, it, you know, it mentions or it mentions like, you know, sexually funny things sometimes, you know, because Rick and Morty, right? Like these, these shows do mention things like that. Innuendos or uh, self-depreciating humor. So The official term, because no, I got all the list of the, the official thing they put on, on boxes of video games. You got suggestive, suggestive teams. And yeah. Then, and then on top of that, you got sexual teams. And then on top of that, you got sexual content. So I'm not sure why it stops, but <laughs> you, you got no this sexual content. You got this spectrum of uh, how, how far you go uh, between showing uh, Rick and Morty engage yeah. in a sexual act, mentioning a sexual act, or just uh, teasing a little something like some <laughs> reference that you would have even in a Disney movie. You know, you are at least a dream yes. works for for the parents there to to laugh at while the the child doesn't really realize what is going on. Uh, we've got Sam in the, the chat room who uh, who's asking uh, how much, what is it, do you, do you have uh, out of your head uh, an idea what's the, the shipping like uh, if you want the Jenga Tower, for instance, uh, for, for Europe? Oh, sure. So, um, yeah, oh, for Europe in general. It's something around $20 US uh, for shipping because uh, we're using Quartermaster, Quartermaster Logistics. Um, you probably, depending on where you are in Europe, that's the issue is if you've got a 20% VAT, you know, and that's just, it just depends. Um, I, I do know that they, you know, Quartermaster uses England, I believe, but I, I'm still waiting to figure out, I want them to tell me specifically like, oh yeah, if it ships from England to England, that there's no VAT or something. But uh, so I'm just in general going to say it's 20% VAT in Europe and it was around $20 US for a box set. Yeah, what well, if you I, go to the Kickstarter page at the bottom, it breaks down. You know, if you're like in Switzerland, is it Sweden? I think Norway and Sweden, it's Switzerland, it's different. There's a couple that are unique, you know. So, but if you go to the bottom, it really breaks it down for you. I think not, not for you because you, you mentioned your experience with that, but uh, I'm showing here, uh, damn the music saved the man. This got blocked. Oh, you got a box set. I got the box set and it cost me Yay. 25 pounds extra because it got blocked at the uh, Heathrow. Uh, border oh. agency and I received a message saying uh, it was wrongly labeled as a book and it's not a book because it's got dice and a box so yeah. uh, they told me either you pay 25 pounds or uh, you cannot have it we, sh we, ship it we ship it back so to all the Kickstarter runners out there uh, label properly your thing so people are aware of the, the cost uh, uh, up front you, you, everything is produced uh, China, the US, England, or different places actually, uh, depending China. on where it ships. China. With this game, it'll be China. Um, I, I had like with my last game, it was a little bit all over. The books were in the US and then all the products were kind of in Hong Kong and such, Taiwan. But uh, well, yeah, with this one, every company we've talked with uh, for quotes has all been Chinese. Okay. You know, Panda Manufacturing, Long Pack, all the, the big names that you're used to. Hopes. Great. These companies are the ones that make you know, wingspan, scythe, uh, you know, like uh, um, zombie world, rap gods, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, uh, the What was the in the name of the wind game recently? You know, so Boss Monster, all these, yeah, there's a lot of great titles. It's a, uh, uh, it sounds like, I mean, if we, if you're working with the right people, it's a very robust industry, which is now in place. We're not at the, the early days of Kickstarter. Yes. I'm just saying because Sam uh, had sadly some uh, bad experience with, uh, yeah. uh, according to him, uh, a Chinese company which put to ransom sort of the developers. But uh, yeah, sad, sad. Well, and like you happen. said, I'm lucky uh, because, you know, the with Kickstarter, I can work with companies like Quartermaster Logistics. So I'm sure, damn the man, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I, from what I know, I'm assuming they, you know, they probably did use someone in house or they use someone smaller in the States, maybe like uh, Ship Naked or something. I you mean, know, it happens. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I ship a lot of international myself, but I'm not going to do it for the Kickstarter uh, because I did, you know, this was a game that, like, I want trusted partners. 
right? <laughs> that you, you're going to be able to contact. If anything happens, they're going to send you a free copy. You know, I mean, like that we're going to take care of people and that no international in and out, uh, unlike me doing it or, you know, uh, a friend company doing it uh, that aren't going to label it. You might pay a little bit more for that, unfortunately, right? Um, but even those rates, like I mentioned, those like $20 for in the EU for shipping, it isn't crazy for no, it might be a three or four pound it's, box. It's, you know, it's that's, fine. Fine. Yeah. I will just throw a little joke there for Sam and uh, the our viewers from the UK. Worst case scenario, the box will get stuck uh, at the border between Kent and England. Uh, just for people who follow the news about Brexit, we're gonna have a border <laughs> inside yeah. of the country. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm about to have to wake up my son from his nap. Oh, it's time. Yeah, it's time. Uh, thank you so much for. I really appreciate the opportunity. This has been great. I mean, Especially just, in, as a dad, I understand your window, so I, I super appreciate you giving me your window, your your time. It's, you it's nice. Uh, and uh, you, you, what's your time zone? East Coast, right? I'm uh, Central. I'm by Chicago. Central. Oh, in the yeah. middle of the United States, yeah. So you still wake up quite early. Sometimes we got people from the Pacific uh, West Coast, and they, they wake oh, up <laughs> very early to be on the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. We're thankful for that. This uh, wouldn't have been too bad for me, but my son, he, he usually sleeps to about the time that we scheduled this. <laughs> and this morning, he was extra sleepy. So I was trying to peel him off of me because he was sleeping on top of me. <laughs> to be honest, normally he should be at the nursery, but he had a little uh, cold. So that's why he stayed with us oh, today. Oh, okay, again. yeah. But... Uh, I yeah, what, what's he, what's she, uh, he he uh, until yeah. he decides well, or the white eventually? The uh, audience probably knows his name. What's his name? Uh, I don't think I ever told this name on the oh, show. Oh, then I don't. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. You don't have to do that. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, people can give, grab pictures on on Instagram. Uh, yeah. What's what's next? How much days are left for the Kickstarter? What's your final pitch? Uh, where can people find sure. you? What's your final word? And, and we can okay, uh, yeah, close that. So, uh, like, like what I'm really excited about. We're about sixty percent funded. Uh, maybe even right now we might be sixty. We were really we were real close when I woke up this morning. We have I think twenty five days. We just started on Tuesday, so it hasn't been very long. Um, as Callum mentioned, uh, you know it's got board game components, so it's. Not, the goal is $10,000. So, it, you know, it adds a zero, right? It's a little more expensive because I have to know I have enough money to order a bunch of these, right? Yeah. Uh, then it wouldn't be another $4,000 Kickstarter or something. Um, but, you know, the big thing here is this is a game about fed up deadbeat roommates that share a pad with the Grim Reaper. It's meant to be lighthearted. It's funny. But for my story game people, it has some themes like Roommates, it's about difficult friendships. It's about bad days. This is a world where everything is kind of, you know, peeing on your leg, right? Like it's everything keeps getting worse and worse and worse, but in a ridiculous, funny way. It's got some cartoon logic. Um, it can really help you bring in people who maybe don't role play with you, who will see the components on the table and be like, what are you doing? Oh, it's like Rick and Morty. Oh, it's like the regular show. I love those shows. It plays in like an hour. Because this tower, how it's kind of staged to work, when it falls, it falls in about an hour. And that can end a session. But if you if you have a group that plays two to three, four hours, you just play multiple episodes. It's kind of like a season finale or to be continued, right? It just keeps going on. Um, so it's fun. It's lighthearted. It's been play tested well. I hope you'll join us. We have a whole bunch of amazing characters from Karen, the Ferryman to the Underworld, to like we mentioned, a, a hidden Deadpool character that we hope to unlock and share. We're doing a cool social share stretch goal contest right now where people are sharing their best, you know, dirty, unkempt, lazy photos of themselves of the profile and tagging rest in pieces. Uh, and we're sharing those in collages and stuff. This week, we're going to open up your best uh, Grim Reaper photo of yourself. So it, it's just a fun thing we're doing because the idea was that we're going to help people share some smiles and some laughs this Halloween season because you know, the election, there's all kinds of stuff that are keeping people down, but we're trying to make people uh, enjoy this Halloween season as much as we can. And I hope you'll help us with the Rest in Pieces Kickstarter. And you're welcome to join us with the uh, social stretch goals, even if you're not a backer. Well, those photos are fun. They they make me laugh a lot too. So thank you. I will include links to uh, most of what we talked about and definitely a Kickstarter and your Twitter account in the description of the episode. So people, please go check it out i definitely be in touch with you hopefully one day about my own kickstarter because i think yeah you've yeah got a i joined lot your play test list you have to pop oh. me in a game eventually yeah yeah that would be... i might be busy this month right but yeah, after of this course. month well yeah for sure so yeah people can join play test on the gauntlet at the moment and i'm gonna run some of grog meatish there's still three seats left there 
I'm gonna run it also at I don't know, I'm running a bunch of it, so go check the links in the description. Uh, I'd love to have <laughs> more players. In the same style a bit, Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring is a bit uh, in the same vein. I'm also going to run yeah. at the Gunlet a game from a, a former guest, a French designer, uh, Guillaume Gentil. I'm going to run uh, Sonia and Conan versus the Ninja. Uh, <laughs> so if people want to try this one, I'm going to run it at the Gauntlet uh, in a week or two. So I recommend people come check it out. It's even available in Japanese now. So, um, oh. so it should be nice. Thank you so much, Pete. And uh, yeah, Pleasure. best wishes of success uh, with uh, the, the Kickstarter. And uh, Thank you. maybe the Grim Reaper will be active with some people this week. We, we don't know what, <laughs> what the Grim Reaper is busy with. Maybe they, maybe they visit in some uh, military hospital at the moment. So yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.